Would you turn with me in the scriptures to Judges chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 8 through 15. I want to say thank you. Uh, what a wonderful privilege it is for me to be here. I remember many, many years ago when you all met in there and I was banging on doors in West Springfield to try to start a church with no one around. Uh, it's been a long haul for all of us and God has blessed your church in a wonderful way. You're a great church and everybody knows that. And uh, you have a wonderful pastor. I've known him for a lot of years. We were both very young then. <laughs> and now we're getting there. I am thoroughly enjoying retirement. Uh, it's been a time with our health and everything, as it always is with older people. But um, the Lord has uh, blessed us in a wonderful way. Uh, I'm very busy with 15 grandchildren and uh, uh, I call them eight children. I only have four children, but the uh, three others, um, the in-laws are like children to me, so I rejoice. But it's wonderful to be here today, and it's very humbling. So if I stumble here and there, you'll know why. But I thank the Lord that uh, Brad invited me, and we pray the Lord's blessing on what they're, they're doing in the retreat. Judges. Verse, uh, chapter 12, verses 8 through 15. This is God's holy word. After him, is Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave, he, he gave in marriage outside his clan and 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon the Zebulonite judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon the Zebulonite died, and he was buried at Agilon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, the son of Halil, the Parathonite judged Israel, he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pathanite, died and was buried in Parathon, the land of Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. And now turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, verses 26 through 29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble truth or birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, take these words and etch them upon our minds and take this servant and humble him before your word that we might all sit at the feet of your word and grow thereby so that when we leave here, we'll leave here different than when we came. We ask your blessing upon the word and its result in our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen. George Herbert once said, 
and this is important to this whole sermon and to the passages that we read, doing all things for God, for God's sake, turns them into something supremely valuable, whether it be sweeping a room or writing a poem. The book of Judges is a transitional book in the Bible. There's so much that is terrible in this book, if you've read it. Uh, so many things that really portray the depravity of man. There's a great change that took place when Joshua died, as we know. He went the ways of the world, that is, he died, and went the way all of us will unless Christ comes before that time. It's true to say that death is the great leveler. Whether we're great in the eyes of the, of the world or just somebody very unknown, death still brings to a close all that we might be and do in this world. Moses had led Israel for 40 years uh, to the doorway of the promised land, but he was not permitted to take Israel into it. He died in Mount Nebo, no one knows where, and so they wouldn't have to feel obliged to worship him and his body. Joshua, that great strong general that stood behind in a side of Moses, who served Moses and uh, remained faithful to God, then uh, he died. He led them into the promised land. There was, uh, as we see in Judges, ups and downs in his administration, weaknesses and strengths. But all was well, and Israel took over the promised land. Not perfectly, but they took it over. But soon Joshua must go into eternity as well. And so many men's ministries in Scripture seem to be almost 40 years or 40 years. It's almost still that way in some of our lives uh, because we're all human and we're all uh, very mortal. 40 is the number, of course, of testings in the Scriptures. Now, as Judges opens, there's, there was no Joshua, no Moses to lead them. The elders had all eventually gone that had been part of that uh, work in Canaan. And the Bible says in Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's a frightening truth seen in the book of Judges over and over and over again. What we have here in Judges the rest of the way are local leaders that rise up to fill the gap of leadership when the going really got bad, really got tough. Now from Joshua to Samuel, who was the last judge? Samuel, really. There are seven cycles in the book of Judges. Each one runs the same course of deliverance, of sin, of punishment, Deliverance around and around and around a circle. Sin, repentance, and then it'd go astray, and then it'd go right back in judgment. The book reveals to us the deterioration of this nation that we look at called Israel. And secondly, the administration of God in the life of his people. In this book, we're confronted by some, some great personalities. You can't miss them, and we, we tend to focus on those great personalities. Men and women, too, who rise up to snatch the leadership and save the day for Israel and for God's kingdom. Some deserve uh, moral attention. And they're admirable leaders, 
at an opportune moment, they rise to the occasion like Deborah did in they do service for God. But others reveal the total depravity of the human race. Some incidents in the book of Judges are almost something that you wouldn't want to even tell your children, so to speak. It was that, they're that depraved. It's not my desire to focus in on any of these great personalities this morning. Rather, I want us to uh, focus in on a couple of men, uh, names, that's really all we can say, names, who led Israel as important junctures of Israel's history, which were no acclaim at all. We, sometimes we can't even pronounce their names right in the Hebrew, yet they judged Israel intensely for a period of time. Who of us don't remember Ehud, who took his sword and he went to the uh, oppressive king of Moab and said, I have a message from you, from God, from Yahweh. And the king's eyes were opened and he listened and he took his sword and he thrusted it through the belly of this king and he delivered Israel. Now we Americans were a real peaceful people. Sort of. But then there was Deborah and Barak. Israel needed deliverance and Barak needed to lead Israel, but he was afraid. So as many men do, he begged Deborah, the woman, to go with him. And the women, two women, Deborah for going with Barak to defeat the enemy and the woman jail who drove a spike through the head of the sleeping wicked king who hated Israel. Then arose Gideon and we know him. Who, would, who could forget all of his escapades in the book of Judges? He judged Israel a good length of time and a number of chapters in Judges are devoted to him and his escapades. Not all good for sure, but he judged Israel and he saved the day. Then there was the man Abimelech, the son of Gideon, far less noble than his father, but nevertheless, they were a, a couple other judges who had uh, short-lived fame in judging Israel and, uh, and of course, jumping ahead to that last one which uh, gives a uh, a lot of the book of Judges to Samson himself. The life of Samson was, even people on the street know a little about Samson. But tucked away in a couple of verses of chapter 12, before the great judge Samson, there are three names of men who judged Israel. We read about them this morning. We really didn't read about them, but there wasn't much to say about them. We have three obscure names we never heard of before or after they lived. They're Ibsen, Elon, and Abdon. Three men who judged Israel a total of 25 years. Now that's a long time. It doesn't look that way to us as we look at the Old Testament history, but many things take place in a country uh, or in the world in 25 years. I, I thought back of 1980. I had the wonderful privilege of uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan, who was the, uh, uh, the campaigner for his presidency, uh, came to Springfield area and they asked me to, uh, to pray with him and eat with him. And uh, it was just a very exciting time. Uh, but I thought back then, 1980, to 2005. Look at what happened to our world. Look at the things that changed during 1980 to 2005. The, the, the Soviet Union itself collapsed. We were, all of us saw that. We were, we were listening to the news every day and saw that. That alone. And there's many other events in 25 years. So 25 years don't look too much uh, impressive uh, as we look at the, at, at the book of Judges in the years that came and went. Uh, but 25 years, 
there was peace in Israel. We don't hear of anything negative during those 25 years. When I was a kid in the Boston, uh, out in Boston area in Foxboro, uh, we were always uh, impressed with the Boston Marathon. In those days, there were very few people that ran it. They were professionals. They really wanted to run it. And uh, they, they were there to win. And there was one Johnny Kelly. I think he, uh, I don't think he's alive anymore, but he ran until he was 100 or something like that. But today, it's different. It's very different. Not so today. Today, there are thousands of people from every walk of life and from every reason under the sun join in the Boston Marathon. Not expecting to win, or probably not even expecting to finish. Their motives are often amazingly noble. We hear it every year on the TV. Some run to make money for a charity. Some run for personal attainment. But many run in total obscurity. No one even knows they ran. They were called the, the also ran. We can call these people the also rans. These people also ran, but they, we didn't know about them. That's the case with these three judges. They're mentioned in Judges chapter 12, verses 8 through 15. Let's look at these three men quickly for a few minutes. There's Ibzan. He was from Bethlehem. He was a, a, a prolific father, to say the least. He had 30 sons, 30 daughters. In those days, it was attractive, uh, more than today, to have the more children you had, the more power you possessed. He probably had multiple wives, which uh, Jehovah permitted. That's all that is said about him. He judged Israel, he had a large family, and there was peace in Israel for seven years, and he died. Then there was Elon. It's clear that this man was a Zebulonite. Now it's not, God doesn't waste words in the word of God. He was a Zebulonite, one of the tribes of Israel. This tribe was a recognized tribe as a tribe full of honorable men who did not shrink back when duty called for them. Evidently, this man, Elon, embodied the, the, the image of these, uh, the, this tribe in his admirable qualities. Yet little is said about him, but he judged Israel two years longer than Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Ten years of leading this people, and nothing is said about what happened during those ten years. Then he died. Now, it doesn't say anything about his administration, but that's just it. It says plenty about Samson and all of the rest of these people, Gideon and the others. The vicious circle of sin by the people is not even mentioned during these verses. It seems all was well with Israel and God during those 10 years of his service. His life was lived in rather obscurity. He judged Israel. He lived and he judged Israel rather well, evidently, and he died and was buried. Lastly, here there is the man Abdon. Where he came from was a city of the tribe of Ephraim, the same tribe that Deborah came from. But he was more obscure a judge than she. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. Now that's important. God, again, God doesn't put these things here for no reason. Uh, it sounds strange to us. What are they doing riding around on 70 donkeys? The donkey, even in Jesus' day, represented peace. You study the scriptures and you'll see that every time. Remember, Jesus was the Prince of Peace, and he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. This here symbolized that the rule of Abdon was a time of peace in Israel. 
All was well during that obscure uh, judge's reign. Nothing was said. There was peace and the sons were proud of that. They paraded around with their beasts of peace rather flamboyantly as we look at the text. Once again, there was a lot of them and so this man had a lot of influence, a lot of authority, a lot of power. These three men were obscure indeed, but they found at least a place in Judges. Their names are with the also rans. If you look at the Judges and you study through, you don't even think about these few verses where these men show up. They were Judges also, but nothing much is said about them. But altogether, Israel had peace for 25 years. Years. Now, how do we value their, their uh, con contribution to Israel's history? Well, let's look at, for the next few minutes, three things about them. First, they did fulfill a role. Why is that important? They did fulfill a role. John Piper, many of you have probably read many of his writings. He's written a significant book called Don't Waste Your Life. I try to give it out to young people a lot because of the nature of what he's talking about. Don't waste your life. If you haven't read it, read it. It really is not how much we do in our life, lives, as to how we do it and why we do it. These men had names. They contributed to build up Israel in their lives. But they did, their lives didn't explode onto hit the pages of history like Elijah and Samson. They were obscure. But they were just, they weren't just extras in history. I get frustrated, I'm a history buff and I, I've read oh, just thousands of pages of history. And the thing that bothers me is the millions of people that had significant uh, con contribution to this Christian enterprise that uh, their names are never even mentioned. There's the big names, you know, the Billy Grahams and the whatever, which is nothing wrong with that, but that's not church history. And how could you possibly put in a 400 page book all of those names that were great in the eyes of God. Their lives played a significant role, these men, in history, in Israel's history. Remember what the poet George Herbert said that I mentioned at the beginning, doing all things for God's sake turns whatever we do something supremely valuable, whether it be sweeping a room or writing a poem. He was right. Your life and my life, lived for Christ in this fallen world, will play a major role in salvation history by just being who you are. And secondly, the also, all these also rians are different than each other. They're all different. If you look at these three men, they're all different. Even the few verses that were mentioned. We are all unique. We all have a role to play. No matter how obscure it seems, at times, each one of us will play our own unique role. These three men did. They were from different tribes and had different gifts, but Israel prospered during, it seems evident, during their time of judging. They contributed to the prosperity of God's Old Testament church. Then God took them out of this life in death. And thirdly and finally, they were all necessarily undistinguished. They were no names. But they did rise to leadership somehow, and they contributed. And Israel, God's Old Testament church, prospered because they lived their lives on God's stage in God's theater during their time. 
She also ran people are well capable of being noble and productive for the kingdom of God. They just don't flaunt their gifts. And you, you know, you look at the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and through 14 and then Romans 12. You look at those gifts and you see that some of them are very apparent and others are very obscure. But God doesn't rate the value of those gifts on the basis of the obscurity or the prominence. Jesus had 12 obscure men who followed him with all of the rabbis in Israel and all the great people. Jesus chose 12 obscure men who followed him. They were from ignoble backgrounds. But in their lifetime, the faith, their faith, the faith went into all the world. There were no names. But God remembered them and blessed their lives as he will your life as well. And how could we forget? We always have to come to this, don't we? Our wonderful Redeemer. But the world today just pushes aside as a nobody as irrelevant. I'm amazed at the conversations that I get into with people and they seem enthusiastic to want to talk about religion and then I mention Christ. And it's just like zero. In fact, driving away this morning, one of my neighbors, a younger woman, that I've had an opportunity to transport to her father who was in a nursing home and I shared the gospel with her uh, the more uh, I shared the gospel with her, the less she, she'll just say hi now. She doesn't really want to uh, talk about the Lord anymore. She, she's uh, uh, proud to be an, an atheist. But that name Christ seems irrelevant to our world, and yet he holds the world in his hand. Listen to what Isaiah says about him. For he, Christ grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of patch ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should uh, look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. What a picture of what a, is apparently irrelevant a person in Isaiah 53. The picture of our Lord Jesus Christ is one of obscurity and insignificance. Yet he lived a holy life and died a substitutional death at Calvary's cross and opened the way for millions to enjoy eternal life. Philippians 2 tells us the whole story. God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. What a picture of God's glory. In the marathon of life, there are few stars Few winners and many runners. Paul calls us in 1 Corinthians 1 to consider our callings. Look at it with me again. Paul says, For consider your calling, brothers and sisters implied not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards not many were powerful not many were of noble birth and in every church it's the same way but god chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise god chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And that arch example 
of humility is Calvary, isn't it? The glory of Calvary. I, for the life of me, I don't understand why preachers so much today seem to end their sermons without Christ. God help us if that is so. What a glory it is to know Christ, isn't it? What a, the beauty of the Lord is evident on the faces of his people. He who was despised and rejected of men went to Calvary. We often forget what he did, though. What he did on Calvary, we understand, but what he did in his 33 years here. He satisfied the law of God perfectly so that he might redeem his people. And then he went to Calvary and he suffered the pangs of hell for his people. The perfect salvation. He took our place. Oh, Christian, don't ever get satisfied in life without contemplation of that fact in your life. Be renewed every day in that. Remind yourself every day in that. I get up 5 o'clock every morning. Quiet, everything's still. And I contemplate on that what I owe him who died for me. He lived a perfect life and he suffered that perfect death and he imputed his righteousness to me and my sin was imputed to him. What a glory that is. Don't ever be bored with it. Don't ever get used to it, you covenant children. It's a glorious thing. And if you're here in this Christian assembly this morning and you don't really have a relationship with the living God, I want to plead with you to look at your life. Look how you've lived your life. As if were, there were no God. But there is a God. And I plead with you to understand fully that your sin has alienated you away from that God. But thanks be unto God, he has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. I plead with you to repent of your sin and flee to this Christ this morning. What a Christ we have. What a glory it is to know him this morning. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Your word brings life to us. There are so many of your people that are so faithful. But no one knows how faithful. They live in obscurity. They serve in obscurity. No one pats them on the shoulder and says, well done. Year after year, they serve in their capacity. They struggle with their sins and temptations. And they are victorious over themselves, Satan, and the world. We thank you, Father, that you know that that you see. There is no obscurity with you. You know every person. And Father, if there be someone here without Christ this morning, I plead with you, Holy Spirit of God, that you would move that heart to repentance and faith. And that that person could walk out like I did 50 years ago out of a church, this church, and know this morning that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord of their life. Enable them, Holy Spirit, to rest upon you, O God, for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Would you turn with me now to hymn number 358? 